Welcome, welcome to On The Square. I'm your host, Michael Coffey. And today, we do have a guest, which I'm going to have him introduce himself in, in a few minutes. Um, and he's going to just talk about social economic issues that's on his mind. He probably will keep it local. I, I usually all over the world and all over the place. But I don't mind him keeping it local because we are in Hartford. And so let, let somebody that really love Hartford, not to say I don't, but let somebody that really love, love Hartford really, you know, talk about what he feels is going on and what can help the city or what can hurt the, the city of Hartford. But right now I'm going to give my little um, bias information <laughs> as I call myself a dispatcher of information. One is I have a pocket which I know you can't see from here, but I, I, I bring it up on every show, a pocket constitution. And I think that, you know, all of us, whether you think you're a, a real citizen, because some of us think we're second-class citizens, whatever you think you label yourself is, is, is a good read for you to read the constitution. Even when you're stuck on 84 going home or you're stuck on 95 going back and forth from New York, you can have a pocket um, constitution in your car, and, and you can read it, but not while you're moving, you know. Second brochure is, um, which I always bring up on um, every show, what to do when the police stop you. Now, um, of course, you got some places that actually have training. I think Texas have training. Um, Mass, in this, the um, Western Mass section of, of the state, have actually, you can go to um, workshops and learn the procedure, what you do when the police pull you over. Now, this brochure was um, published by the National Association of Black Law Enforcement Officers. So these two brochures, I always bring them on every show, you know, so just to remind you, um, the name of this show is Welcome to On the Square with your host, Michael Caffey. I want to say um, Jambo, these are our greeting, Hotep, Rahu back, these are in the other language. I also want to give a shout out to the uh, Morris Science Temple. I want to give a shout out to the Rastafarian culture. I want to give a shout out to the Prince Hall Masons. I want to give a shout out to the Nuwabians. I want to give a shout out, a shout out, excuse me, to the um, Nation of Islam. Now, um, I just want to read a, um, a couple of things. Um, I want to give a um, let you be aware of the Free Alabama Movement. The Free Alabama Movement is a group of people that is fighting against pr um, prison labor. You know, using um, cheap labor to make a whole bunch of products that's, that's made in prisons. Most people just only know their license plates. Some states make license plates from prison. Um, labor. The Black Law, the Black Land, excuse me, initiative. This is out of Oakland. This is an agency that tries to, to get housing for people, you know, affordable housing, to have your own house, not to go into public housing, but to have your own house. Um, the Justice League, which is out of New York City, um, the Poor People Campaign, and if you go to their website, poorpeoplecampaign.org, it will pull, and you put in the state that you're, you're um, from, it will pull up the representative in that state that represents the poor people's campaign. These are some of the age, and then there also is the New Era, New Era Nation. That's out of um, Detroit, Michigan. 
they have seven or eight chapters around the country in Washington, D.C., um, in Chicago, um, in Ohio. So you get the idea. They, they're, they're scattered throughout the country. These are some of the other things. I also have um, a couple of um, quotes that I always use. One is figuring things out for yourself is the only freedom that you have. A lot of people get mad when I say that, but I believe that. I think a lot of things are rigged, a lot of things manipulated, and a lot of things are um, contaminated with um, bad intentions. So it's only you figuring out how to navigate this system and, and not do harm to other people is the only freedom that you have. I'm taking this quote from Muhammad Ali. Muhammad, Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali, I'm stuttering right now. Muhammad Ali um, quote is that the service you do for other people is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. Um, and the, um, the last quote, I don't trust the system, but I have faith in humanity. And that's, that's coming from me. I didn't originate that quote, but I believe it 100%. Now, I'm also a, a firm believer of Saturday Academy. So not only do you send your young ones to school, but you should be sending them to after school. And I'm not talking about a program. I'm still like more schools. You know, I'm a firm believer of survival schools. There's two su survival schools in Connecticut. One is, um, well, both of them are down the other end of Southern um, New England. So we're talking about the Fairfield and um, County and New, um, New London counties, those areas. And what I mean by survival schools, like if, if a, a hurricane come, a snowstorm or whatever that, dis you know, um, destroys the, the area, the town or the region, that you know how to, su to survive in, in those predicaments. I mean, FEMA tells you run over to this shelter and, and this and that. Some people don't leave their house. So when you get into that trouble, what do you? What are the things that you can do to get water naturally? Um, do you have food supplies stored up? First aids, you know. Do you have a will? You know, you, all these things is to help you to survive that particular disaster. Um, I'm a big believer of rites of passage. Now, it seems like a lot of times we do a rite of passage program is is more about the ceremony. I'm thinking doing a rite of passage program that involve incentives. So you want to you want that young person that's changing from a youth to being an adult to really have to make it more than a ceremony, have it a uh, uh, incentive to to really become an adult, like maybe having a fund for college or entrepreneur project or something like that. Give them some incentive to really a hundred percent and trying. To be that productive um, adult. Um, the last thing is, um, well, it's two other things. It's a civic club, and I think my guests would agree uh, agree with me that we need to know more about the political process and how we can help make an informed vote. You know, I like how he talks. I like how he look. I'm gonna hit this lever. We we can't just we can't we no longer can do that. If you're doing that, we got to say who is the most practical candidate that's going to help us move Hartford, move Connecticut to a you know a 21st productive region, so so we can compete and we can be a, a great place to live like it was in the 50s. Even though I wasn't there, but I read about it. Um, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> now um, the last thing in this category is study group and a study group you can call it a bit a book a book club anything that you you're you're getting people together and you're studying whatever you're studying we we do need to know a little bit more about american history we do need to learn a little bit about the political process we do need to know a little bit more you know um maybe even just basic things like how to, to um change spark plugs in a car how to um Fix your furnace. You just some basic stuff that we we need study groups to just learn some of the fundamentals that used to be common knowledge for a lot of us. I even heard that you could most people this young man's age learn Latin. 
You know, I know when people want to say it's a dead language or whatever, but we need to know we need to be multicultural in terms of language. You know, some people say you need to know Spanish because, you know, the, the demographics are changing. Some people say economics, you need to know to speak Chinese. So whatever you need to know, but we need to know a little bit more than English, <laughs> you know, coming further into this um, ending of this century to know a little bit other than English to speak on. Now, and I'm about to wrap it up so we can get our guests to start talking. Oh, I'm almost on time. There's a little things that I, I do want to uh, mention. There's 100,000 people that have a need for kidney transplants. 80% of those people happen to be black. I don't know why that is in terms of the amount of donations is not up to the level to um, cover these people that need these organs. But that that needs to be addressed. Another thing I want to talk about, there's an estimate that 50% of Americans don't have a will. And you don't know when your expiration date comes up. And then you know that your situation is going to go into probate court and your, and your, res, your, your relatives are going to be fighting over whatever is left if the creditor don't take everything away from you. 25% of the U.S. household have no bank account, meaning they're saying that you have less than, you have around $400 in the bank for a rainy day fund. That has to be Im improved. We have to save more, but which that means you're taking money out of the circulation of the economy, which the politicians don't want you to do because they want you to keep spending to have the economy, the, the money circulate. But when now when you need an emergency, you want to go to those same um, um, elective officials to ask for help, and then they're saying you're looking for a handout. So you need to save a little bit more. We all do. I want to give you the last thing, the capital switchboard in, in D.C., 202-224-3121. So if you want to call, when you get there, you, you put in a zip code or you, you request your um, legislator that you want to leave a message because I don't, I don't think he, gonna, he or she going to talk to you, but you leave a message anyway. And if more of us tie up the line, let, let them get motivated to just hear we don't have to rely on them coming here for a town hall meeting. That means you got to sit around and wait for them to come here. Let's bring some of the information and our, our grievances to them in Washington, D.C. And so I'm going to, because my time is pretty much up for the news brief, so I'm going to allow the guest to introduce himself and, and tell us what he what's on his mind. I think the topic is mainly about the city of Hartford. But he can really talk about anything. You can talk about Connecticut. You can talk about the midterm elections. You can talk about economics. You can talk about global warming if you want to. So, Anyway, thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> My name is Mike McGarry, and I've been around town for a while since the 70s. I actually lived right over here on Ashley Street. Back in the 70s, there was... Um, a movement called the Back to the City Movement. We had riots in 67, 68, and 69. Did you know that? We had terrible riots here. And a lot of people left. Middle class whites, blacks, they left because they were afraid the city would, wouldn't come back. So what was started was called the Back to the City Movement, where the companies got together and they offered people like me a chance to buy a house. So the first house that I owned was Ashley Street, right across the street here. 40 Ashley Street. They made it possible for a young man and his wife and his couple of boys to buy a house. It was five or six years before I really should have owned a house, but the deal was too good not to take advantage of. At that time, I could look out from my porch and see five abandoned homes on Ashley Street. So we've come a long way since then. We still have a long way to go in Hartford. There's been ups and downs. There have been movements and there's been controversy and there's been people who've Broken the law and people fed the law and made the law. Now, my history here is interesting, I think, at least to me. I was down to Harvard City Council for nine years, or six years on the city council, three terms in the 90s. 
I went with Mayor Mike. I'm going to tell you a funny story here. You're one of the few to hear this story. Mayor Mike would not have become mayor had it been for the Republican Party. He was beat by Mayor Perry at the time in a primary by 1,800 votes. Well, you lose by 1,800, that's it. In the steam room of the YMCA, Bob Lutz, my old friend, and Nick Carbone, a famous name, bemoaning the idea that Mayor Perry could be mayor again and Mike couldn't be mayor, somebody mentioned we had 3,000 votes. Came the dawn. He lost by 1,800. We had 3,000. We made a pact. Very conservative Republicans, which I am, with a guy who didn't much philosophy, but all his friends were somewhat liberal. We all got together and we created a, a government at the time, went on for six years, that did a lot of good. If you look around, public housing has changed dramatically. That was because of us. You look at the new buildings downtown, the six pillars plus, would never have been if it wasn't for us. We had tax cuts, three tax cuts of, in three where we didn't increase taxes. We brought in businesses. We had a great time. We went up to 500 police. Today, can't blame anybody because there's a lot of things that go around, but today we're in a different situation, much different situation. What's happened to Hartford? I don't want to get in trouble, but I'm going to explain. Out of the goodness of our hearts, we've created a dependent city. We create a program, we draw lots of people to take advantage of that program, and then what happens is we need another program. We draw people for that program, then what happens is we need another program. Every single one of these programs are good-hearted and doing good things. We've come to the point, though, the city now is a dependent city to a great degree. Most of our property is not taxable. A lot of it out of the goodness of our hearts. Where does this stop? I don't know. But we have to look at things where people work and do their job, don't break the law, are kind to their neighbors, kind to their families, good, solid families that take care of each other and take care of their neighbors, not just in Hartford, not just in Connecticut, but in the whole country. It's a shame that we have so many divorces, shame that we have many single parents. That's been a breakdown that's hurt all society, but especially Hartford. Anyway, to, to things that are... Um, a bit more promising. I've been involved in a lot of things. One of the things I'm involved in is the Hartford News. You should pick up the Hartford News to find out about Hartford. We have great writers, very interesting things all about the city. We have a daily newspaper, the Harper Current, that's really more involved in regional, statewide, or national news. The Hartford News is about Hartford. You can pick one up a lot of places, Arrow Drug, for example, up and down Franklin Avenue, downtown, lots of places you can pick up a Hartford News. If you don't know where to go, it's 860-296-6128. We'll tell you where you can pick up a Hartford News. It's been in business for over 40 years. Started the Southside Neighborhood News, now it's Hartford News, comes out every week. We have lots of interesting things. I write a column every week. This week I talk about making the move to Hartford. A big bank, United Bank, that came to Hartford, and there's all the reasons why they did. Creating lots of jobs for Hartford people, paying lots of taxes, creating lots of good act activity downtown. So there are a lot of promising things. Our mayor and our council are working hard. I don't always agree with a lot of what they say and do. But they're trying hard. Another very positive thing. My friend here was just looking at this book. Well, I'm proud to have been the person to write about Hartford in this great book called Connecticut 169 Club. This Sunday, if you're listening, this Sunday at 2 o'clock at Barnes & Noble downtown, the fellow who put this together, Marty, will have a lot of local authors there, and he'll be talking about this book. It's strange how I got involved in this. I have a cottage in upstate New York, in the Adirondacks. This fellow did a book about the Adirondack towns. A lot of them long gone now, mining towns. Very interesting history. I contacted him, told him he should do a book about Connecticut. Well, it took a while. Imagine going to 169 towns to get local historians, local town clerks, guys like me, to write about the town. Get it to them, check on it, 
make sure it was written well, that it was factual for 169 towns, some job. But the book is here. It'll be at the Barnes & Noble downtown, or you can always call the Hartford News. We can tell you how to get a copy. That's a really neat thing. These little towns are so interesting. Now, we had a discussion here about 169 towns in Connecticut, hard to get things done. Well, I don't agree. The towns I know, because I know people, I'm on the Republican State Central Committee, so I know people all over the state. Where it makes sense, the towns cooperate. Some people say we don't need all these principals, we don't need all these superintendents of schools. Well, a lot of them understand that. They bonded together. And Sonia and Derby right now are going to meld their school systems to reduce the cost, the overhead. Where it makes sense, people want to do it and do do it. They do purchase together. They do work with the state police together. So the myth that these towns don't work together is a myth. They do. And I like the idea of being able to control your own government. If we had a countywide government, ask people to live in New York State. You lose that local control. Now, I'll give you an example of an ordinance in Hartford that didn't work. And now it's changed because people like me went to the council and said, change it. They had the power to go to their neighbor, the councilman, and say, look, it's not working. We fired or laid off our tree, tr tree trimming crew. We put it with a private company. Now, I like privatization, but this one was a mistake. Because they're a private operation, coming to trim trees, knock them down, they needed a policeman to stand there while the work was done. That takes an extra person at a very high price. So you didn't have a crew of six, you had a crew of seven. Plus, of course, when a business had to be paid an overhead, and the guys that did this work went to court, the city employees were laid off, and they won. So guess what? Because the citizens and the workers complaining about this, we're going to have our tree trimming crew back. And we need it. You can see all the dead trees around town. Another mistake that you can help change was that god-awful trash ordinance. Did you follow that, the trash ordinance? $75 to get rid of your mattress. Well, if you're a citizen of Hartford, you don't have very much money. You're not going to pay $75 to get rid of your mattress. In the middle of the night, you're going to take that mattress, and guess what? Pope Park has got a mattress. That's what happened. So, see, we citizens got on the mayor about that, got on the council about that. Now they pick up trash everywhere the way they did it before. There's still a charge, but if they see a pile of junk, they pick it up, and hopefully they'll change that ordinance, and so on. The beauty of a city government or a local government is anybody can go to a council meeting and talk. Anybody can buttonhole a councilman or a state rep or a state senator if they live in that town. If you have a larger, larger unit, like a county or a much bigger city than what we have, your voice is lost, and that's too bad. Well, anyway, I also involved some other things you might be interested in. I'm with the Knights of Columbus. What a great group of men, Catholic men. We do all kinds of great things all over the world. Um, the Knights of Columbus did more than government in Puerto Rico. You ask the Puerto Ricans who carried the ball, groups like the Knights of Columbus. Others too, the American Legion, uh, the Masons. But the Knights of Columbus, since it's a Catholic uh, area, Puerto Rico, um, Knights of Columbus got together from America, not only kicked in money, but went there and worked. Very quietly, you never saw a headline. But groups like the Knights of Columbus do great work, and I'm one of the Knights of Columbus in the Cathedral of St. Joseph. I almost call it Grand Knight, imagine that. Uh, we do great things there. You go by the Cathedral of St. Joseph, you see the flowers, we planted them. There are also several Spanish Knights of Columbus in the city. So if you're a Catholic gentleman, ask about the Knights of Columbus. I'm also a member of the Republican Party in Hartford, and we have lost our seats on council, which is too bad, because Republicans have good ideas. And I'd love to see the Republicans pick up their seats again. I know the Working Families Party, and I don't agree with them a lot, but fine men and women are with the Working Families Party. But now Give me an example of what you know. 
that you, the disagreement that you have. One example. They get involved in these international issues that have absolutely nothing to do with Hartford, or Hartford had nothing to do with them. Okay. They should be concentrating on the day-to-day -day problems in the city of Hartford. Now, my friend Doc um, had an idea one time to take the big building downtown, the old YMCA, and make that a homeless shelter. Sorry, that's not the thing we need to do. We don't need to take a viable commercial area and turn it into an area essentially with homeless people wandering all over the place. Why did they close the old YMCA? Because that was part of the problem. People living there and not living by the rules. Let's be honest. People that have trouble don't make for a viable neighborhood. That's part of our problem. We have a halfway house here. We have a distressed person house here. We have an ex-criminal home here. When you have too much of that in a city, it's very hard for hardworking tax-paying people to coexist with too much social service. We didn't need the center of downtown that pays all the taxes, creates all the jobs, has most of our recreation downtown, like most cities have a downtown. You can't make it so socially dependent that it's not going to work. There was an idea that didn't go anywhere, thank goodness. But they're nice people, and occasionally they have great ideas. But I do think we need Republicans back on the city council. When we were there back in the 90s, we cut taxes. We got the governor to do a lot of stuff. We got rid of public housing. A lot of the things that you see today, we can go around and point at. Hartford Blooms, for example, is my little project. We, years ago, we went to Ireland. 20 some odd years ago. Uh, council people, Republicans and Democrats, and Mayor Mike. We saw how beautiful Ireland was. Flowers everywhere. The Celtic Tiger hadn't hit yet. So Ireland was pretty poor. One third unemployment in Ireland at the time. But the towns were beautiful. So I said to Mayor Mike, Mikey, look at this. Poor old Ireland and look how beautiful it is. But look at Hartford. What a bore. So he turned to me and said, Mikey, it's your job. My job. What the hell did I know? It was my wife. You know the pots all over town that you see? The flower pots? That was Marguerite's idea, my wife. She said we should honor veterans of World War II with flower pots. And we did that in 1995. Out of that grew Hartford Blooms in cooperation with Knox Inc. And you see all over town flowers. It came out of that effort. Did it cost much? No. Do people enjoy it? Yes. Has it enlivened all the neighborhoods, but especially downtown? Yes. All out of an idea that came out of Ireland and a bunch of work and working people getting together and making these big pots of flowers and their own gardens all over the place. You go, again, I can show you gardens all over the city that came from that effort. A lot of businesses today, Wooden Tap, for example, uh, V's Trattoria, uh, right in front of CVS on Farmington Avenue, uh, some of the fire stations, some of the federal buildings, some of the city buildings. You see flowers now where back some years ago there weren't any. So you see, citizens can do a lot especially when you have local control and local efforts. When you expand that for, quote, efficiency, usually you lose your say and you lose the efficiency. So I like 169 towns. I like to cooperate, share efforts when I can, but I like the local control. For example, if we were parred with West Hartford, we'd be the losers. Why? Because West Hartford has more votes than we do significantly more votes than we do. So you really think we would benefit by being a suburb of West Hartford rather than vice versa. No, we wouldn't. We should control our own fate. We should do better. A lot of things we can do better in Hartford. For example, why do we own Batterson Park? It makes no sense. Batterson Park was not open for the last two years. It should be a regional park with all the towns cooperating. It should be a lake authority or a state park. It should be open, and Hartford should be paid for its effort and for its land. Another example, the top of the landfill is sitting there empty right now. There's some solar panels up there, but there was a plan to put greenhouses up there. For some reason, this administration has not followed to that plan. Imagine that. We could create jobs, revenue for the city, 
and fresh fruits, vegetables, and flowers for use of everybody. They do it all over the country. Why aren't we doing that? Well, I don't know. I wish I knew. And all over town, we have those examples. Uh, I like the people on the council. However, they've had such trouble with finances, they don't seem to be able to move on to other things. Uh, they, they say, want to create these trash ordinances instead of figuring out a way to make some money out of the trash like a lot of cities have. Our neighbors have now a collection, or they're going to be collecting Manchester. They'll be collecting rags. They don't have to go to the landfill. They don't have to be burned. Those rags will go to a private company, eliminating a lot of the cost of what they do in Manchester and as part of the whole idea of improving our planet. There's a lot of ideas out there that we're not taking advantage of. Somebody's got to do it, and it really, quite frankly, it should be Republicans. They could bring up ideas and work with their Democratic friends and counterparts. I'd like to see that happen again someday in Hartford. Right now, we have an election coming. Um, Democrats probably will win everything in Hartford. We do have a couple candidates running, a couple young men getting their feet wet, which is good, and they should. Uh, the Democrats like to have competition. I'll give you a secret. If they don't have competition, they can't go to the public fund and get very much money. They get very little with no competition. Obviously, why do they need campaign money if they don't have any competition? So like Ed Vargas and Matt Ritter, Matt doesn't have a candidate this year, but Ed does. Ed's very happy to have someone he can debate about public policy. Um, uh, same thing in the state senate race, down in the first. The second, sadly, we don't have anybody running. But the day may come when Hartford has two viable parties, Republicans and Democrats. That would be terrific for the city. Now, on another subject, another quick one here, we do tours, Hartford Blooms. Next year, we're going to be doing a tour called At Home in Hartford which means there'll be homes open all over the city. You'll be able to visit homes for a very small amount of money, pay for the bus transportation, actually. We're going to take people around a South End tour, a North End tour, a Downtown tour, um, and a West End Salem Hill tour. Four tours the first weekend of May. For a very small, maybe a $10 bill, you'll be able to take a tour section of the city and for a little more, all the tours if you want. That's all an outgrowth of that trip to Ireland. We went to Ireland, we created Hartford Blooms. We've had tours now for the last five or six years. We're gonna expand it now citywide. And that's why we did those tours. We took Ashley Street back eight years ago. And in one day, we did all of Ashley Street from Garden to Huntington. We brought in landscape architects, the Hartford gave us some money, and in one day, May 1st, eight years ago, we transformed Ashley Street. All volunteers, all private money, all done out of the goodness of our heart. Now Ashley Street's one of the most beautiful streets in town, that, that block, that long block. And you see what Nina has done up and down Sargent. We've transformed this neighborhood over the last 10 or 12 years. Nina gets a lot of the credit. But what the credit, real credit is the people that live here. They watch out for each other. People daren't cause trouble on this street because the people that live here won't allow that. Can't say that for every block in the city. But this block changed. And in one day, it became the most beautiful block in town because we all work together. That's what we need in the city. We need groups like the Knights of Columbus or the Masons or the, the unions to pick a project and get it done and get it done right. We don't need a lot of governmental money to get most things done. In fact, the, the best things are done without governmental money, where the neighbors get together and just do it. We have NRZs. I think there's 11 of them now. We have 16 neighbors. I think there's 11 NRZs. Some work very hard, like the Salem Hill one, the West End one, a few others. Others are kind of moribund. But when they get together and take a project and really work at it, that's the way we accomplish things, the old-fashioned way. We don't have the money, nor should we spend taxpayers' money on things that can be done by the local neighborhoods. Now, we do have to invest money, the city, on certain things. So happy to see this outfit, CRDA, with enough funding and a very professional staff 
to create the apartments downtown, to run the Excel Center, to run Rensselaer, to run the Convention Center. That's being done, and because it's being done locally, you can go to one of their meetings and they'll listen to you. You can go to Mike Freemuth and tell him what you think and he'll listen to you. That's the beauty of doing things on a local basis. When you try to deal with state government, everybody's got a story. That's why we talked about county government. I don't want to see that. So anyway, these things are all going on. You'll read a lot about them in the Hartford News. And I'm willing any time to talk to anybody about these kind of things. Today, for example, I'll give you an example of the pen and the neck that I can be. There was a whole big news conference about this new card, which is a good idea. You buy the card, you put money on the card, you walk in a bus, you slap the card down, and you go for a ride. That's better than fishing for change. That's better than losing tokens. Just take that card, show the card, it'll give you the right price, and away you go on the bus. Works out terrific. Now, once that was over, the governor said, do we have any questions? Nobody any questions. Do you have any questions about transit? Governor, I have a question from the Hartford News. Why does the state allow, why does the Connecticut Transit allow those big piles of snow in front of the bus stops? What good are the bus stops, what good are the buses if you can't, in bad weather, get at the bus stop? Well, he was flummoxed. He didn't know what to say. And he finally said, well, in Stanford, we cleaned out what you call them curb cuts. And the guy from New Haven, they clean them out. We don't here in Hartford. We don't clean out a way for you to get to the bus stop. Remember last year, that piles of snow? For months, you couldn't get out of bus stop. Now, why can't that be handled by some level of authority? Or why can't neighbors do it themselves? Someone has to push that. Someone has to make that an issue. And you know what? The Hartford News is going to make that an issue. I'm going to quote the governor, quote the guy from New Haven, saying that they go out of the way to clean the bus stops. We don't do it here in Hartford. You've got a lot of operations that could do that. You've got the court where they go out, what do they call that operation? The community court. Why don't the community court guys clean the bus, bus stops? Not a big deal. You got a shovel, you dig something so wide, then people can get at the bus stops. Um, why isn't it done by the public works in certain areas? We pay for the public works. Yes, they're on demand, but in the middle of the winter, if they're out there with their equipment, they could do some of the more popular, busier bus stops. Why can't the Business Improvement District expand its efforts all over the city? with their crew. The Downtown Business Improvement District and the uh, Business Improvement District on Park Street, that kind of thing should be done on Franklin Avenue, on Farmington Avenue, passed where the bid does now. So we had to think a little bit out of the box. You know, we got a problem, you got to solve it, sometimes using, yes, government, neighbors, private organizations, semi-private organizations. Look at the problem, figure out how to solve it, and solve it. We're missing that in the city to a great degree. We really should do more of that. So anyway, I think I've talked long enough. Is there anything? No, no, no. It's good. You, you didn't. We I got didn't, time. We got, got time. a few more minutes. Okay. Well, it was a little bit past the few. You got time to expand on our, our thought. You All right. Have, now well, let's go statewide now. Right now, the state race. I happen to be a Republican, and I'll probably vote for Bob Sepanowski. However, I'm not happy with this campaign. I tried to tell him locally. Go to local issues. Say that you can try to solve some local issues. He hasn't mentioned any of them. Take our viaduct problem. You know about the viaduct. The viaduct is either going to be billions and billions for a tunnel, the congressman wants to do, or billions and billions for a half tunnel that will tie the city up for maybe five years. Or you leave it alone until new technology comes. So you got three options. If I were running for governor, God forbid me running for governor, I would go to Hartford and say, look, you got three options. I'm going to study those options. I'm going to ask your advice. I'm going to bring in worldwide experts from Seattle where they built a tunnel, Boston where they built a tunnel, and we're going to come up with a solution. 
No one expects a candidate to solve the problem. The candidate should know the problem and know he's got or to speak to it. put it on, 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 on the ground level like Milwaukee did. Yes. Milwaukee had an elevated highway and they dropped it down and business popped up around because when you're elevated, you're, you're not going to stop. There's no way to stop for a business because it's under you. So you keep going. But once you have it on a, on a, on a sea level, you have business right here that you can just go into and patronize. Well, here's, here's what happened in Seattle. They took the elevated thing and built a tunnel. And on top of that, they built a park. And they've had billions of dollars in investment because it's along, you know, it's along the, the ocean. You can see the ocean from there. They, like we ruined our river front by building the highways along it. Well, the same thing in Seattle. Just bringing it down may not be a sensible thing. No, I'm. I'm you got to figure out option. a mix. That's an I, I, option. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. I'm, I'm not. I'm not picking a, a, a sea level highway versus a tunnel. I'm just saying it's more than what this government is doing. What they're doing is doing patchwork. Every time you go by that stretch, they're of, spending hundred million dollars. Yeah, they, you see crews working under their patching. You know, patching up things. That's that's a that's a, a huge project to be patching. Well, it, 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 to me, it's a very dangerous situation. Well, let, let me explain. I know too much about this. It would be at least 10 years before, it, whatever plan they got, it's at least 10 years. In that 10 years, you have to keep what we have stable. So we're spending tens of millions of dollars fixing up what we're going to tear down. But you don't have any option. You can't have the road fall down on people now. So, and here's another problem. Because the government, the way it is, they can only bid out, they can only plan with today's technology. Ten years from today, when they finally get this thing done, whatever they do, the technology will change. Everything will be different. Self-driving cars, self-driving taxis and buses, you may have flying cars. Who knows what ten years is going to bring with today's rampant technology. So we're building something now based on today's technology that's going to cost billions, disrupt the city for years. By the time it's done, it'll be out of date. By the time it's done, it'll be out of date. Can you imagine 170? So, so, so that didn't stop. I don't know what we're going to do, quite frankly. Hey, well, I'm, I'm not paying 100000 a year to figure it out. It didn't stop Milwaukee. It didn't stop Seattle. It didn't stop Boston. That's right. So and, something's going to be done. And, and, and I'm not suggesting to let something collapse until you, you come up with a solution or the finance or the, or the technology. Another thing is just because somebody come up with a technology don't mean that's going to be uh, 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 it's going to be beneficial to society. Look what happened with um, um, these um, these like businesses like Amazon and, and FedEx and all that. They're now taking back not using drones to deliver packages to um, um, customers. They're doing it in, in the warehouse, but they're not going to bring it out on the, um, in the communities because they realize that somebody can shoot down those drones to get the, the package, yeah. and, and, and they realize you, you can't clutter the skies with all these drones flying these packages. You, well, certain places that'll work when you're way out in the middle of the boonies, yeah, that way will up work. in the mountain. Yes, that uh, will work. Yeah, yes. Technology always has goods and bads. Someone told me that self-driving cars will change our world dramatically. I've been studying it. Now, a lot of people told me this, and I've been following it. A guy from Cato Institute, Conservative Institute, five years ago came to Trinity. A libertarian. Libertarian. And he pointed out what's going to happen with self-driving cars. You're not going to need as many police because the cars won't break the law. You're not going to need insurance because there'll be very few accidents. They won't put them on the road to their safe. We know that. They won't put them on the road to their safe. Much safer than me driving around. I've had two accidents in the last three and a half years. Neither one my fault. When I was almost killed, I was on a bicycle, and I got run over by a guy without a license. Well, I'm better, I hope. I feel okay. Easter Saturday, I'm parked ready to go to regional market to buy some flowers at 7 in the morning, and a, a fireman in an SUV as big as this studio ran into me, and I was just doing my business. Luckily, I didn't get hurt. Car got wrecked. 
So I've seen what our drivers can do, you know, recently. None of us are good drivers a good part of the time, let's be honest. When we're in a self-driving car and they won't be on the road until they're as safe as safe can be, are much safer than we are, let's be honest. I would like the option in a safe driving car to be able to take over in case the internet went out. I would think you'd be got to be able to do they that. They do have that. Yeah, they already figured that out. But what will happen in 10 years is dramatic. Um, but we're building these massive, expensive structures based on today's technology. Now, I don't know what else we can do, but let's look at it. Does that make that much sense to tear up the city for five years? spend maybe 10 to $15 billion to wipe out a big part of our grand list. Yes, they're gonna give us some more land, but to do that, they gotta knock down apartment houses, factories, storage areas, and create great disruption. For example, when they tear that thing down, imagine Farmington Avenue, Asylum Avenue, and Albany Avenue. Imagine what they're gonna look like when that highway is being knocked down until they put the new one in. Imagine that, you know? Imagine the suburban towns. People are gonna to try to get around. My son is on the, uh, he's the president of the council in Hamden. He's a lot better than his old man, right? And he has to go to Fairfield every day to teach. He's an English teacher. He knows the way around, how to get around every time it's a tie-up on 95. He scoots around it. Well, when we have these tie-ups, what do you think people are gonna do? They're going to take every side street to scoot around. So nice, quiet streets, you might live in a nice, quiet street. If it's a way to get into Hartford, what's going to happen? Or a way to get downtown, in, your, in like the West End or the North End. People are going to find ways to get around that traffic tie-up, meaning every street in the well, area. Well, it's, it's just like Prospect. Up. It's like Prospect, and you, and you go down and you, and you use Beacon. To get scooted around. That's right. You know, people are going to do the shortcuts. You take away 175,000 cars a day going on A84, where are they going to go? Now, the congressman's plan is a little different. He's going to build a big tunnel, billions and billions, nobody has any idea what it's going to cost, that would take away all the through traffic and all the trucks would go underneath. There's no reason for them to stop in Hartford. Two-thirds of the traffic would still be local, and they're going to build boulevards. But still, sooner or later, that thing's got to come down. So all these plans are very, very difficult. Nothing easy about them. And I really am not sure of the outcome. But it still bothers me that we're going to do all this damage to the city, spend all this money based on technology that's out of date right now. So anyway, that's just the... So what do you think with the XL Center... Excel there's Center, a there's a different time. I was there before you probably were in grammar school. Maybe you weren't even alive. I was there before the Excel Center. The night before it, blowing down the streets of Hartford were newspapers. There wasn't five people on the street the night before the Excel Center opened. You used to call it the Veterans Memorial back then. The night it opened, Hartford was booming and continues to boom there when they have events there. A lot of businesses rely on that. But it's a great thing to have. I mean, it's gotta be rebuilt one way or another. I don't wanna see it knocked down because we're gonna have a big, huge hole in the middle of the city. It'll take 20 years to fill that hole. They've gotta take it and refurbish it. It's gonna cost money, a lot of time and effort, but the advantages there are tremendous. They hire a lot of people, a lot of people pay sales tax there, a lot of people move here because of the action going they need, on. They need, they, they need to put a couple of things, and I'm not saying turn it into a mall, but they need to put a couple of things in in, in, in the building. They need more seats, yeah. not 2,000 seats, but bring it to 20,000. I agree. And and then and then the biggest cost is the the, the heating and, and and the cooling system is. It, it, gotta be fixed. It yeah. gotta be fixed. Yeah. But it's worth saving. I've been arguing this for it not because i'm a big fan of it but this is the practical solution yeah. and, and instead of stop and, and why don't a city of this size have so many little venues make one venue that's big enough to accommodate a a a, a big event you're, you're working on the um 
the what you call it the um the baseball um stadium and you don't give it an option to make it bigger cuz I didn't I never been in there so I didn't look at it to see if you can you can put another deck on there you you you're trying to put money into the Dillon stadium you you know that the Yukon football stadium need to be bigger that's why they couldn't get into the Big 10 because the Big 10 have a minimum um seating capacity which is 50,000 and Yukon is 40,000 and then you have the um the stuff over in the Meadows. You got all these different projects. Make just put some money in the XL state um stadium. Well, I agree that could get fit. I'm I'm all for that. I, again, I was I remember when we had 65 stores in there. You were probably in grammar school. There's 65 stores in the convention in, yeah. in that XL center. Hopefully that day will come again. I do like going down to Front Street. I like the bookstore, the Barnes & Noble bookstore. I like the great happy hour, the spotlight. I'll be going to um, the Harvard uh, Current Travel Show uh, this weekend. It's two days. I'll be going to the XL Center to the uh, pet show. Not that I got any pets, but I like to go see what's going what? on. Now, th there's uh, the convention center and the XL Center serve two different purposes. Many places are all the same, but there really wasn't land available. I was involved in this a little bit. There wasn't land to build the facility you're talking about. They just didn't have a physical space. You're Matter of fact, the, you're talking about this, the, the convention the center. Oh, the, 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 the convention, convention center, center. Okay. yeah. Right. I was on the city council when they wanted to put the football stadium downtown. Mm -hmm. And we knew from being around to put that football stadium down there wasn't going to work. We said, how are you going to get the traffic in and out? We have very limited streets downtown. If you go to any of these other cities where they have a ball field, there's, except for, of course, at Boston where, you know, Fenway's kind of stuck in there. Um, you To put that kind of thing right in the middle of the city, very difficult. I like the ball field. I've been there. I was for it from the beginning. You're talking about Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts worked mm -hmm. out very well. You may be right. Maybe it should have been bigger. But everybody said nobody's going to that thing, Right. Everybody said it's going to fail. Everybody said the parking is going to be terrible. Everybody said, oh, nobody's going to go to the games, blah, 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 blah. Well, half the games are sold out. Every time you go, you have a great time. They know how to run things over there. Well, They're that's not the, expensive. What, they did a great job what, at the baseball the, stadium. What the... What the with the person, I don't know what the, ti the title you call, the person is providing the, the, the um, venue for somebody not to be bored to death did an excellent job. Because I definitely, i never been to one of the event there, but I heard some of the things that they have there, which I think is a good idea. So whoever is behind that, they, they did a good job. It kind of reminded me of the ABA before, the, you know, the, the, the league that was um, competing against the NBA. Yeah. What they did with the AB, ABA, and now I learned all this by going to Springfield Basketball Hall of Fame. It's not because I was there, but, you know, you learn about it. Sure. That they had so much entertainment at these games that it kept the the the, the um, consumers happy. Yeah, yeah. So it's not all about just watching the basketball, but all the other stuff that you you had to do. And this is what this baseball is doing too. They're having movie, free movies and all that and entertainment stuff. This is what helps. I'm, I'm not a big baseball fan, so I'm I'm not going to go to watch a baseball game. But you also have other things to do there, so that makes it. Yeah. Um, well, we got two minutes, so if you want to okay. say. Something to close I, out. All I'm saying is get involved. Join an organization like the Knights of Columbus or the Masons or your local party, political party. Get out there and do something. Get out away from the computer. Get off the tele. Get away from TV. Get off the computer and be part of the city. Do something special. Create it's a, a walkable city, right? It's a walkable city. You can go anywhere. Do anything if you want. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of things to see, but do something. Create something. Build a garden. Join Knox and get a community garden. But get off your duff and get out there and make it a better city. And if you need any help, you need any advice, hey, call me and I'll keep you busy. I'm Mike McGarry. You get me at the Hartford News. Anytime. Thank you. And I'm your host, Michael Coffey. Thank you for coming in because I know you're a busy man and I appreciate it. That's it, huh? Yeah. Okay.